the challenge, I, I guess one way of, of being a little bit uh, positive about the future is I'm actually going to go back a ways in time. So some of the stories, instead of starting in the 1970s or 80s, some of the slides you're going to see go back even further uh, as best as we can uh, reconstruct to what the lake system might have been like before the sort of population explosion of humans, which uh, in this area happened around 1840 or so. That's when, when you started getting Easterners moving in here, uh, and then waves of European immigration, and then there was, there was basically a massive population explosion. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about sort of what changes did they make to the lake system, what changes did they make to the land all around the lake system, and that, and that feeds this watershed. Um, and, and then get into sort of some of the modern versions of, of how you can do it. The one thing that's common to all of the issues that I'll, I'll bring up tonight is that they are, many of them, much bigger than Lake Winnebago. And so they're about pressures about nation building, they're pressures based on uh, industrialization, a whole lot of things that were, were much bigger, but they end up uh, affecting even a lake of the size of Lake Winnebago. So just uh, as a sort of a rough outline of where we're going to go, a little bit about the Winnebago pool, um, but then get quickly into how the watershed has changed. Uh, what are some of those ecosystem responses that you get when you change uh, a watershed and, and you make changes to a lake, even a lake this big? Uh, invasive species, we, uh, Andrew introduced that idea. You, you probably heard several speakers in this series talk about invasive species. It's sort of the, one of the big problems that we're, we're wrestling with right today because we're trying to come up with ways to try, uh, make it so that that problem doesn't get significantly worse in the future. Um, and then I'll also uh, talk a little bit about what climate change is predicted to do on sort of the regional scale and with some very loose ideas. Some of it's not so simple, like, you know, will we have ice? Um, but predictions about what this may end up doing to the big lakes. Um, so one of the things I always start with is just the size of the, of the Winnebago pool so that people can recognize it. Uh, as far as the contiguous 48 states uh, of the United States, it's the fifth largest freshwater body in terms of acres um, because we split those Great Lakes up there. Uh, so Michigan's the only Great Lake that's really 100% U.S. Um, and we actually, for a while, were behind a, that Mexi that one down in Texas and Louisiana, but that one's basically drying up. So it, it shrunk to about half of its size over the past decade. Um, it's a big enough lake you could find it if you ever get a ride in the space shuttle, um, especially in the wintertime. It's easy to make out when it's got snow on it. And it has a lot, for the state of Wisconsin, it has a lot of superlatives. Um, in fact, I just, watching Kendall's talk, thought, oh, there's one more I need to add up here. Um, so 17% of the surface water inland lakes in Wisconsin is represented in this system. Um, the watershed drains about 12%. I'll show you a, a map in a minute of where that is. Uh, so that's all the land where if water falls onto that land, it's going to drain, it's going to come through the Winnebago. Uh, over 2 million people live within 75 miles. That's a figure that's often used by tourists, tourism boards for day trip type estimates. So that's the range at which people could come in for a day trip. There's 2 million of us. Um, and uh, the last time DNR did this survey was 1989. Uh, Kendall was talking about how, they, how hard it is to do krill surveys. It apparently is much harder, in, in some of this politics, even harder to do a boat survey. Um, but the last time they did it in 1989, it was basically equal to, to the whole uh, of the uh, Mississippi River boating. Um, and it was about equal, actually it was bigger than Lake Superior, uh, the Wisconsin side of Lake Superior. So the last one I'd, I need to add now, uh, watching Kendall's slide, is it looks like it's about 10% of the state's uh, recreational fishing dollars are represented by this system. So that's what the watershed looks like. This is actually a little bit bigger watershed. Um, you can see here, there's sort of one to the uh, 
to the, that drains to Green Bay, in a sense, that isn't our, the watershed for these lakes. That's the drainage out of this one. So if we just ignore that one little piece, you see that there's two other big uh, watersheds that this feeds into. Uh, to the north, we have the Wolf River system. And to the south and west of Lake Winnebago, you've got the Fox River system, or the upper Fox River. And this map uh, happens to have some colors to it that correspond to different types of land use that people have put to. And, uh, and you can see that the northern end of the wolf, for example, is very green. That's the part that's still forested. You can almost make out a square in there. That's Menominee County, or Menominee's, the Menominee tribal lands. That's that, the square block that's sort of the farthest south of, that's still almost fully forested. Um, but you can see that what probably was a formerly heavily forested to the west side of this is now very spotty. Basically removed a lot of the forest, turned it into something else, primarily for agriculture. Uh, agriculture is, is the yellow. And so you can see that that's by far the dominant thing that goes on here. About something like 60% of the land use is agriculture uh, that drains into the Winnebago. Um, the light blue is wetlands. You can make that out. There's a lot of wetlands. Uh, there used to be even more. Uh, a lot of them were drained for agriculture. You'll see basically yellow against light blue. That probably, in a lot of cases, land that used to be wetland might have been wet forest that's been turned into agricultural land. And the last color in there is the pink, the urban uh, setting. You can see we've got quite a bit of that in the system as well, uh, particularly right up against Lake Winnebago, where there's at least three big uh, units of, of urban area. And probably as a, before I move off this slide, just mention in terms of urbanization, uh, it's, there's a, it's pretty easy to predict that basically Oshkosh and the Fox Cities will eventually just run together. What farmland is left between the two of them is basically being sold and developed at a fast enough rate that, that within the next 50 years or so, you'll basically see nothing but a pink stripe coming down the, the, that, end, that side of Lake Winnebago. Um, and there are probably folks who are working their way north from here uh, and thinking about joining that group too. Uh, Lake 40, uh, excuse me, Route 41 is basically a corridor for development that will probably fill in within the next half to full century. OK, so this is what it looks like from a satellite. And satellites give you a slightly different view of things. The colors are a little bit different, but this sort of zooms in a little more on right next to the lake. Um, and here are the colors. I'll translate them a little bit for you. Here, uh, white is all that urban area. It's rooftops, asphalt. It actually shines back at the satellite and gives you this white color. So you can very easily make out the big roads and everything else in this map. Um, pink, in this case, is, um, is actually bare ground. So that's, uh, this was taken in the in early summer, but there's a lot of either uh, recently plowed fields or fields where the corn hasn't come up enough. It's still looking like bare ground to the satellite. So that's a lot of, you could think of that as being a lot of exposed ground um, that might end up leading to some issues with erosion and so forth. And green is, is actually green in this case. There's not a lot of forest. There's hardly any forest basically left in this picture. But you can get a layout for the, for the system. The Fox River comes in and the Wolf River come in through those upper lakes. Uh, this does not show uh, there's a good set of multiple set of rivers that come in down at the southern end here. Um, that's not shown very well in here because of uh, Fond du Lac kind of blurs. Uh, and you can't make out rivers down there. Um, but the general flow is, of course, in to the lake and then out via the dam at the north end. And that dam, historically, is a very important, um, probably the most important thing in terms of what was done to the lake directly. So in terms of a historical layout for what went on here, about 150 years ago, you had people move here and start farming. And, and so we probably had serious farm runoff going for something on that order, about 150 years. You can probably go back to about the Civil War and, and have that much, uh, and have that being a problem, in a sense, for the lake. That uh, 
The plowing back then was pretty crude. They were uh, taking what forests there were around apart to try and expand the farmland. And when you do that, you tend to get a lot of erosion the first couple of years. Um, pointing to a lot of places around here, basically, where there are rivers coming in, and because and, those are going to be hot spots where you're going to get a lot of material. Um, and certainly, I didn't, even though I don't point to it here, those rivers down here in Fond du Lac would have carried a lot in um, and, and probably changed the depth of the lake here. The second thing is about 100 years ago, and it had to do with the first set of dams that were put up in Nina Menasha, uh, which weren't as high as the ones right now. But that's about probably when we started really stressing the marshes by raising the water levels. And so we've had about a century of marsh loss on the system. I'll show you uh, a study in a minute of the upriver lakes um, that, that was really detailed done by Rich Kale of the ENR back in the 90s. Unfortunately, there's nothing equivalent for, for Lake Winnebago. We don't have a map, really, of map lo of marsh loss. At least I've never seen one. And the third one that uh, I'll put on here as sort of a big historical stressor is water pollution. And that would have come primarily from the cities, from the urbanized areas. Um, and that probably peaked uh, or, or really ramped up about 60 years ago. Um, and, and then we can talk about how that's actually probably changed. Of these three, you could have a debate about this, but of these three, you could say basically we've probably as a society done the best at controlling that urban pollution. Um, we've essentially done very little about marsh loss. The DNR does have projects they've been trying to restore, but that's a very, very recent idea. Um, and the farm runoff has probably been mostly in the last 20 years or so that, that there's really been a significant effort. Although you can go back to the 1930s when they first started uh, teaching a lot more and working out a lot more methods about how to reduce runoff via uh, plowing uh, and other ways of uh, improving equipment and, and practices on the farm. So with urban pollution, one of the reasons I say we've done a lot with it is that we've actually seen it change from a question of the factories and, and also because of the huge human population here, we have to recognize that, the, that we've always had a huge amount of sewage going into these lakes. Uh, you've got something like uh, even just in the cities alone, something we've always, or for the past 60 years at least, we've had populations of somewhere on the order of 100,000 people. Uh, and if you go back 60 years, there was hardly any treatment on that. That would have been almost raw sewage going into the system. So that probably peaked about 30, 40 years ago. Um, then we built all the big sewage treatment plants, added them, improved them. Billions of dollars went into that kind of thing nationally. Um, and we also did a lot to try and regulate the industry. Or in some cases, for example, in fact, in all of these cities, the industry was moved off the rivers back into uh, industrial parks and some other places. So the problem today for the urban area is actually described mostly as a stormwater problem. It's, uh, it's that problem of like Kendall was showing of the drain. What goes down the drain? What are people putting on lawns? What are people, uh, what falls out of, off of cars and leaks in parking lots? And, and what do we put on the road in terms of salts and, and all of that sort of thing? Um, it's that runoff that we're focusing on most. The other sort of pollution sources have been wrestled with for uh, the past 30 years. OK. With farm runoff, uh, as I said, the, the issue is really not so much the sort of nasty chemical pollution, what can it do? It's, uh, it's actually a very biological problem um, in that we've got sediments and nutrients coming off of these fields. Um, they are contributing to that aging of the lake in the sense of filling bays in and filling it in a lot faster than it naturally would. Um, but they're also, along with carrying all that sediment, you're going to carry in a lot of nutrients. And of course, in this region, we, we have one particular kind of farming with dairies, where we have a lot of animals and a lot of waste. And that waste is not being handled the way we handle human waste, although it's basically the same issue. Um, and so 
because one of the main nutrients that we use is, is uh, manure for uh, fertilizing crops in the region, it could be a nice system in the sense that you have you know, animals that you're raising, you get the waste product from the animals, you raise their feed. That could be a fairly good loop if it were well regulated. If we, and, and some of those practices are coming in. For example, uh, pushing back the date of manure spreading further and further into the spring so that it doesn't just go flushing in there when the snow melts. So there have been some changes in the last few decades. But the problem all of that ends up causing are the, the blooms of algae in the lake, and, and it'll also feed uh, the weeds. So basically, what we try to do on land to grow plants, if we aren't good at controlling that and keeping it on the land, it's just going to end up going into the lake and making something else grow. OK, so this is the study I was telling you about before, where Rich Kale actually constructed, it's a really neat project that, that he did. He did a, some of it from uh, photography going back. Um, you know, so someone would take a picture from the shore looking out, and you'd see all these marshes, and you'd see boats, and, you'd, and it was you know, a picture of duck hunters and so forth. Some of you have probably seen uh, Art Teclo's talk with some of those old photos in it. And so he actually, there's scientific ways to sort of say, well, if you were standing here and you see that, that's a certain distance. You can, you can figure that out. Um, there were old maps that were around. Um, the other day, I was looking at, uh, in an antique store locally and picked up a map that really isn't that old. It's younger than me, 1979. And in it, you can clearly see why Lake Winnicani is considered a separate lake from Lake Poygan. Today on the map, it, it, you know, most people, when I show this to young people, they're like, what's with that? You know, is it just the people on one end didn't like the people on the other end? Or, or you know, how did that happen? But if you look at a map, even in 1979, you can see the vegetation being drawn in, and I'll show you it in a minute, that makes it very, very clear. Oh, yeah, those are two different water bodies. But it was, it was vegetation that's now gone, largely. Um, so what you see here in sort of stripes around the edges is that's the existing wetlands. That's what's left today. And you see it around the mouths of the rivers, uh, the Fox coming in uh, to Lake Butamore in the south, uh, the Wolf River coming up to the north. And actually, every, pretty much every place you see marsh there, there's something, the Rat River or uh, um, some of the uh, pine and some of the ones that are on the west side of Poygan. So basically, only where we've got rivers still actively um, making it marshy do we have marshes left. This is what they, he reconstructed. And so um, this has all been lost wetland. Estimates are somewhere around 25,000 to 40,000 acres. And I think visually I like showing this because I think you get the idea pretty easily that, um, that a lot of this would have been emergent plants. That was, it was kind of like a giant filter on the system. So whatever would come in from that huge watershed, 12% of Wisconsin, would have come in through those big rivers, um, would have had to bypass, get through a lot of marshland. And so even if there was a lot of sediment coming in or anything like that, a lot of those marshes would have collected that, kept it from getting down and, and working its way all the way down into Winnebago. So you can think of Winnebago today as kind of being without a filter um, in a biological sense. Probably parts of Winnebago, you could draw, you know, if, if we could, we, we'd see sort of similar things. Those shallow bays that some people are kind of frustrated with if they live on them, um, probably would have been a lot like this too. We would have probably would have had a lot of fringing uh, wetlands and marshes. And, and again, DNR has spotted a few of these and tried to get them restored um, on Winnebago. The, so, one of the things I wanted to mention, um, and actually Kendall came sort of close to it, um, but now I'll put the professor hat on. So one of the things, of course, I used to teach was ecosystems. So how do ecosystems actually respond? Um, and one of the theories that, that came out in the last 20 years or so is that a lot of lake systems, big, especially big shallow lakes, 
they don't even have to be big, shallow lakes have basically two states they want to be in, two places where they're stable. So in other words, you can have it in one or the other of these states and it'll be there for a long, long time. And it'll be a perfectly balanced system. And the referred to Mother Nature not caring whether it's just a bunch of algae and carp or whether it's a bunch of plants and, and a diverse fishery. Um, and this is actually the theory sort of behind it. So you can have a, a, a lake, a shallow lake that's, big, that's clear, has lots of plants, lots of diversity. I know after watching Kendall's talk, my fish are pitiful, but lots of different kinds of fish. Um, and the other is you can have a lake that's turbid, meaning it uh, looks dirty, can't see through it. Um, and it's dominated by algae, not very many plants. And usually what we see with that is a lot less diversity in the fish. You might be able to find everything, but, but you know, some of those populations are not going to be as health, healthy. In Kendall's terms, we basically got lots of, of that pelagic and very little of that littoral zone in the bottom. And, and so the theory is that either one of these will work. And so the question is, what, what gets you into one or the other? And that's where the ecologists have been trying to figure out. So they have some lakes, for example, in Florida. Florida, of course, gets whacked with hurricanes. And they've seen some lakes do this flip if they get whacked too hard by a hurricane. Um, so, so basically what ecologists are trying to figure out is what are the shocks to the system that can make it go from flip from one to the other. And uh, one of the, what I, I would surmise reading some of the work that Rich Kale did and so forth is that somewhere around the 1960s, Winnebago flipped from the top condition to the bottom. And the sort of nail in the cop, well, the, the real cause was damming the lake and re raising it by three feet and then losing your marshes for decades and decades. Um, but sort of the, the nails in the coffin were in the 1960s. We got three flood years in, in a row, floods that we normally would only get once every 10 years. Three of them came within, you know, like every other year. The last of the marshes sort of flushed out uh, Lake Butamore gained several feet in depth because it just got scoured out. Um, so a whole lot of stuff happened to the lake, and basically it flipped to the, to the algae-dominated type of system. The other thing that probably made it worse that, that scientists have na nailed down is that if you at the same time start pouring a lot of extra nutrients in, you really get it to flip down into this lower one. The question is, in 2000s, did it just flip back? Um, and that's a question. That, but one possibility is that it's going back to that other system. Uh, it's getting its plants back. Um, it's not that we're restoring all of those marshes, but maybe we're doing, I think, I'm, I'm, I'm fairly confident, we're doing a much better job on the farm. We're keeping the nutrients up there. We're keeping them out. Um, the urban pollution's getting controlled, so we're taking the sort of nutrient shock slowly away from the system, um, and and the plants are coming back. I'm going to come back to that slide uh, with another issue a little bit later. Um, invasive species. So invasive species are uh, sort of a newly recognized problem, although. On land, we've known about them for a long, long time, right? I mean, who knows how long people have been fighting dandelions in this country? Probably somebody in 1847, who grew the first lawn, probably started fighting dandelions that they dragged along with them from the East Coast. Um, and so, so we've sort of known what they were. They just didn't have this technical name. Um, but they're non-native. Um, but even more important, they're kind of species who can take over. They, when we, when we dive into individual species, we find you know lots of seeds or eggs or something where they can just explode in population. We find they have some kind of advantage. They uh, they might be missing down there on success. They might be missing natural predators. So something that kept them under control back in Europe or Asia isn't here. Uh, diseases aren't around. So they basically go through a population explosion. Um, Problems are caused, nature species, the native species can't hide or they can't compete or they can't fight back, so they get eaten or 
or outcompeted. Um, and often these species are described as aggressive. In some cases, that's literal, like rusty crayfish is actually a really aggressive little animal. Um, but but you can even talk about that just in terms of how fast they grow and take over a patch if you're talking about plants. They're prolific and they mature early. So these are all ones that we have in the Winnebago system and they all have different stories. Uh, carp was introduced on purpose because it was a, they wanted to develop a commercial fishery to sell to the city folks. Um, zebra mussels came in via uh, trade on big ships um, and then on probably little boats uh, to get up into our system. You see a couple of plants there. Um, the milfoil is probably the better known story. It showed up in the Winnebago system around 1974. And then we have some that are sort of marsh plants like that purple loose stripe, which was brought in by gardeners who thought it was pretty and it is if it stays in the garden, but it escaped into our marshes and, and tends to take over. So you, one of the stories here I want to make is that you know, there's no single bad guy in the invasive species story. We've, if there's a way to bring species in here in the things that we like to do, we've probably done it. So that makes it tough to try to figure out ways to slow that down. Um, I'm going to skip that because it's basically the same thing. Uh, this is just meant to show that there's, we've got probably a, a dozen or so invasive species in Winnebago now, but in the Great Lakes they're approaching 200. So, and that's and including Lake Michigan. So that's only a few miles, basically. That's just over the hill. There are people who move back and forth between those all the time, um, and so there, there's some real issues there. We also have a water connection via the Fox River for organisms that might be able to move up or hitch a ride that way. Uh, just looking at plants alone, um, we can see that we've got a list already currently of non-native plants that are in the system. Some of those uh, are known to people to be bad things. Other ones like yellow flag, you can probably find that in people's yards around here. Um, and have you know, trying to grow it right on the shoreland. The nursery people were still planting it as of a few years ago. Um, reed canary grass, that's been actually promoted by the state Department of Transportation and the state agriculture because it's a, for its very reason that that if you have some bare ground, throw some reed, some of that on there, it grows roots and ties down the soil, and great, now we've stopped the erosion problem. But we all have this really aggressive plant. Um, so you go around some area, air, basically anywhere around the Winnebago system, uh, you can easily find reed canary grass. It's, it's everywhere along the shore. Future. You'll notice there's a, a whole list there, including things that are from places like Brazil. And so, a lot of these are a question. A lot of those are for sale still. Um, Kendall was just telling me about, you know, he was in a shop and there was a whole bunch of that water lettuce at the top of the list. Water lettuce is now one of the, just to give an example, another northern, another big northern lake, Lake Champlain over in, in New York and Vermont. They're, they're spending about a million bucks a year trying to control water lettuce. Andrew? And um, I'm only going to talk about one um, that is fairly well known in the area, uh, Eurasian water milfoil. And I'm mostly going to tell this story just as a control story um, because it has a couple of interesting things. A lot of people know that a few things about Eurasian water milfoil. Um, it basically got in the U.S. in the 1940s. It got here around the 1970s. Um, it's probably the most common invasive species in Wisconsin lakes. Um, it forms really dense mats, so that means it can be a nuisance, particularly to boaters, but it's also no fun for swimming. 
uh, although it's probably in areas that are pretty shallow for swimmers. Um, and it also is known to displace a lot of native vegetation. But um, so when you get fields of it like that basically growing out in your lake, you're looking at either chemical treatments or, or physical removal via harvesting and so forth. Um, and that's a lot of area. Um, you know, some of these might be hundreds of acres, and that, that, that can get to a point where you can't control that with harvesters, and you couldn't afford to do it with chemicals. They, they roughly cost about the same per acre. Um, but there's a native bug, uh, a weevil, and uh, it is used to living with our native milfoils, and the Eurasian milfoil is a little bit thinner. And so what happens when this weevil gets in there is it damages the stem, breaks it off. It doesn't kill the plant, doesn't eat it down or do anything like that, but, it, but it's enough of a nuisance to the plant that it keeps it under control, keeps it from becoming too much of a problem. And, uh, and there are some uh, examples in Wisconsin where one side of the lake uh, is sort of uh, lawns and, and rock and uh, lots of houses lots of uh, Eurasian water mill soil, and in other parts of the lake where it's still forested, they, uh, you don't see as much Eurasian water mill soil. And one, one reason that may be happening is these native weevils. But what the weevils need, and what they're lacking in a lot of the Winnebago system, is they need leaf litter for the winter. So they're out in the lake during the warm weather, they're, they're harassing and controlling the Eurasian mill soil, getting along with your native plants just fine, but then when it starts to turn cold, they start coming out and they, and they need a place to spend the winter. Um, and it's leaf litter on the shore. And in, I mean, most urbanites, they scoop up every single leaf. They leave not a bit of vegetation that isn't mowable on the shoreline, so they basically create a complete desert. So even if a weevil showed up, even if we went out there and sprinkled them in the water, and, and spent money on that. If people don't provide a winter habitat for these little animals, they, they're not going to be able to do the control job. But basically, they, they, it's possible that they could be established. Um, and they may even exist in certain areas. Um, often, uh, I could never talk a student into doing this for their graduate degree, but I always wanted somebody to go look at uh, the Jesuit point <laughs> and see if they're, if they're around there. Um, uh, controlling things. But then there may be some other, a few other forested patches, but forests on Lake Winnebago is a pretty rare thing. Um, how do they spread? Uh, I've mentioned this in a few, a few different slides, but in the case of, of these plants, we, we, you know, boaters and anglers and other water users, because they can move things uh, around, um, would be sort of a prime consideration, mostly because of their numbers. Um, we could also get it through commercial sh shipping and construction. We have a lot of barges, construction barges, that move around the system for doing different projects, and they'll move from lakes. They'll even move from the Great Lakes into the Winnebago system. Um, we have water gardens and aquarium owners. If they're buying some of those cute foreign plants and growing them in a pond, and then something spills and it gets into the lake. Um, and then there are natural dispersal methods. So it is possible for for birds and such to move things around, but um, but you're not going to get a load the size of that trailer moved around by something snagged by a duck's foot or something like that. Um, Winnebago's got lots and lots of public access points for boaters, um, and so when you think about trying to educate, which Andrew was talking about, this is a lot. That's a lot of places to be. Um, on every day when it's a beautiful day for boating like tonight. Um, so, so there's a challenge there just by the size of the system and how many entry points you put in. And these are just the public ones. There's probably an equal number of larger private ones. And then, of course, there's the thousands of little driveways that people cut so they can just go straight in off their backyard. Um, Andrew already mentioned this, so I won't spend a lot of time on it. We got clean boats, clean water working on the Winnebago since 2006. Um, I helped start that. They even Right now it's actually, I think, going to have its biggest year. Um, they, in addition to the county folks, there's, I think, going to be something like 13, 14 students hired from the Oshkosh 
to cover the system. And so um, it's basically a public education campaign done right at the boat launches. And they do collect information. Um, I'm curious, how many people have actually talked to one of these clean boats, clean waters people? Any boaters? None. Oh, it must be talking to property owners or something. <laughs> or just concerned citizens. But if you had, they'd be hard to miss over the last five years. You'd have to be pretty sneaky or you'd have to have a, a launch. If you went to any of the big launches, you'd be bumping into them. And, um, and one of the things on their statistics that we can tell, because they asked a whole series of questions, is whether or not people at least say that they understand the laws or know what the rules are. And we moved that number from something like 50% in 2005 up closer to 90%. And so uh, I've heard DNR describe this as sort of, you know, a classic success story of when you, if you just do this regular educating at the boat launch, that you, you know, it is sinking in. At least people know what's right and, and wrong. Okay, there's that chart again. So the last point that, uh, that I wanted to make that we sort of know from recent past is, um, is if this lake was flipping and it flipped in 2000, you know, one question is, do shorelines matter? I've already given you one reason to think about it if you want to create some weevil habitat. Um, but you see I modified this a little bit. So on one side, I've got some natural shoreline there with, with trees and shrubs and, and uh, native wet plants that like their feet wet. And then on the other side of the lake there, the lawn and rock. And um, there's a study done, you notice Chad Cook's name on the bottom there, he helped us a great deal. We had some funding from the DNR and we did a study of residents around Lake Butamore. And we chose Lake Butamore for its size and also because it's, it, of all the lakes, like, when, like Lake Winnebago, it has urban, suburban, and rural residents still around it. So we thought it's a good little microcosm for knowing what the, the attitudes are in the system. And uh, so one was uh, about lawn perceptions. There's a whole lot of questions. We had a very high return rate on this uh, survey, and there's a, a summary of it in the back on the table. Um, how many of them value what their lawns look like? 94%. How many care what the neighbors think of their lawn? Three quarters. Um, how many believe their neighbors value a well-maintained lawn more than they do? So 88%. So in other words, they think their neighbors are even more worried about what's next door than, than they are. Uh, that's a classic, like, you know, I'm, I'm very open-minded, but my neighbors aren't kind of uh, result. Um, the lawn to the shoreline is the most is eye appealing, 81%. Lawn adds to property values, 87%. I mean, you can see these are probably all tied together, right? So if you think the neighbors care, or if you think your, you know, the people who are likely to buy your house, who come from your neighborhood, uh, if you think they care, well, then that's what you're going to do. You're going to do the same thing. Um, if, that, if you build a new property, you're going to change it, basically, to look like whatever everybody else has in the neighborhood. Um, at the time, we also were looking to find out what they thought about fertilizers. And basically, um, lawns were important notice that most of them felt that they needed to fertilize it. And uh, most of them knew that if they added the fertilizer, it was going to pollute the lake. Um, they, so they did realize that, but they didn't know much about the fertilizer itself. So um, some of the, most of them basically didn't know whether getting fertilizer without phosphorus was possible or expensive or, or anything like that. Um, the state, in a sense, took this off the table by banning the sale of phosphorus fertilizers a few years ago. So instead of taking the generic stuff that, can, that they sell all over the United States, um, they basically said, that's, that's illegal. Now for lawn fertilizers, you shouldn't have, you should get something without phosphorus in all of the local stores. Okay, um, why would shorelines matter? I'm just going to give you a couple of quick reasons. One is... Um, this idea of the buffer, that that natural shoreline is going to let give you those plants that are going to be a buffer, which is probably important for a couple of things. One is we still have this sediment and chemicals from the land that are washing in. Um, and so if we don't have that buffer there, if we have this sort of sterile rock 
edge to it, um, then basically its nature is going to be uh, isn't going to be able to take care of a lot of these problems or or clean up some of these messes. Um, the other is uh, erosion of the shoreline, loss of property, um, tied with raising the water levels, we got a lot of erosion, and then people naturally, you know, started putting the rock out. They started, you know, armoring the shore to try to protect that shoreline. Um, in Winnebago, we also have the you know, somewhat unique phenomenon of ice shelves, and they, they can do a lot of physical damage to a shoreline. So people are armoring against ice in the winter time as well. Uh, back, you know, today the water levels are managed to try to minimize that, but there was a time when they weren't. So a lot of shorelines got armored, uh, probably to protect against what was happening with ice. Um, the second one is wildlife habitat. Um, and so, uh, you know, to mention a few things that aren't fish, um, there are birds, amphibians, uh, turtles, beneficial insects that, that would all use that habitat along the shore. Could be those weevils, for example, that could be doing, could be helping us uh, control Eurasian water milfoil, but we don't have a, a winter habitat for it. In the water, there's some interesting studies um, uh, about what happens if you have trees and shrubs. So if you're messy enough that you actually let trees grow on your shore and then you let them fall in, you, you create three-dimensional habitats out there for fish. Um, and so even though the walleye, we all heard, are, are, are taking their trek up the rivers, um, there still are a lot of other fish that are looking for that structure you know, in close. Um, and, and in a natural lake, that, that would be provided by trees and shrubs, not just whether or not the plants made it that year. So the kind of thing that Kendall was saying at the end of his talk, where, well, there was enough plants that made it through the winter for the perch to, the perch wouldn't have that problem if there was basically woody material getting into the lake. Um, and the last one is invasive species. So when we uh, modify these shorelines, we basically make it, um, uh, I've looked it around here, but um, natural shorelines can probably discourage these invasive species because the uh, good, healthy native population is probably the best defense that you have. Um, a good example uh, where I live in Oshkosh is uh, Miller's Bay. People saw dense growth of plants in Miller's Bay for a long time, and they and they came to say think that those were invasive species. But surveys that we had done, and, and most recently a, a very detailed survey paid for by the DNR, sort of settled the question there, uh, um, showed that in most of Miller's Bay, which is over 100 acres, it's native plants, and we find hardly any invasive plants in there. It's a good thick weed bed, and it's holding its own. Go over near the, um, near the boat docks and the places that are disturbed, um, that people have been putting chemicals in, that they've been doing a whole lot of stuff, and there you always find Eurasian water milfoil. It's always there. Um, so we can basically set up a situation where healthy ecosystems could probably fight off these invaders, but, but damaged ecosystems probably can't. The invaders will get in and they'll get established. Okay, uh, climate change. It, the first thing I'll say about climate change is it works off of, uh, a lot of it is based on big global data sets, big global models, um, but it has about 50 years of, of very, very heavy research behind it. Um, it's research that gets attacked quite a bit, but one of the ways that I often explain this to people is that if you look at anything else and you said, you know, any other line of research that got the kind of resources we put on trying to answer the questions in climate change, for example, uh, to figure out uh, how to deal with cancer, most people realize that in the last 40, 50 years, we made a huge amount of progress in cancer. Um, even though a lot of people still love the old jokes about the weather service, uh, weather prediction is pretty amazing. 40, 50 years ago, you know, they wouldn't, wouldn't put anything in the paper past tomorrow. 
And today you see a five-day forecast, and it works pretty well most of the time. You know, by tomorrow you'll be able to plan your weekend. And that's due to a huge investment in scientific research. Same thing's been going on in climate research, but not everybody likes the answers that are coming out of it. This is basically, what I've done is sort of put two things together here. Um, the words on the right side are from a Wisconsin initiative on climate change. This is at UW-Madison, which is one of the top meteorology schools and climate research schools in the country. Um, they put out this really, it's a really nice website, and it is, it is targeted, like the Wisconsin idea, it's targeted at serving Wisconsin citizens. So what can we say about what's going, what we think might happen with climate in Wisconsin? So we basically have world-class scientists telling us what they think might happen in Wisconsin. So one of the things they have on there that's kind of, a, you can play with it a little bit, although it, it is pretty geeky and has lots, way too much detail for, for most of the public. But um, you can go in there. They have this mapping tool that is called an analog climate tool. And um, that I've always thought was a, a really clever way to, to sort of try and describe people where, where are things going to be in the future. And so what it does is it, it uses these climate data and models going off into the future and it says, well, what's it going to be like 50 years from now? So we could go visit these places and see if you like them or not. If, and, and see if you don't mind Lake Winnebago becoming like this. So you, when you do that, and off, off on the map, I've actually put the stars of where they say hey, there's a climate today where they think it'll be. So in 50 years, it's the middle of Illinois down there, about 300 miles south of here, is what they're predicting our climate will be like winter and summer. And then about 90 years from now, basically 2100, uh, it'll be about 500 miles, and it'll be actually further west um, of that. So. The map, though, that I put it on, just so you know, some of you might recognize it already, this is the gardener's map for uh, zones from the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Now, this map actually already shifted about 50 miles. They just they redid it. Um, so if you have an old book more than a couple of years old, um, those zones will all be actually further south because they've had to move them for the climate change that happened in, in the last century. But um, but just so you see, if you go down, basically 50 years from now, you'd be going down into that, into the next zone, basically, for, ve for vegetation. You'd be going down into a zone five. And then basically in 100 years, we'll get to the edge of a zone six. Um, one of the things I'd mention with respect to lakes on that map is the, right in here, this sort of where you can see we're actually on an edge because all the way up the coast it's quite a bit warmer. We're on the edge of a zone here and basically that line right there is probably the line at which you have predictable winter ice. So you can see that we're moving quite a bit south just in the next 50 years basically pretty far out of the normal ice covered lake area. And it's quite possible that Wake Winnebago will just hold enough heat, it will warm up enough every summer that it just it won't freeze. And, and it won't mean, mean, I should take that back, it won't mean that it'll never freeze. We'll still get a cold snap coming down from Canada some winter and, and everything will freeze and people will say, see, there's no global warming. But after a while, it'll be one out of five years and then it'll be one out of ten years. It'll just become rarer and rarer for the lake to actually freeze. And by 100 years from now, now you're down into zone six. There's no frozen lakes down there. Doesn't matter what blast comes from Canada. It, you, you don't get, they don't ice skate in Missouri. Okay. So that's, you know, that's probably the most obvious physical thing that people will notice. I grew up in Massachusetts. I grew up playing hockey for what felt like half the year. Sure it wasn't. That, that old folks thing about how deep the snow was when you were a kid. So. I could have sworn I just skated half my life. Um, I go and visit there now, visit friends who live on the same lakes I skated on. Oh, you know, what do you kids do and stuff? Well, first off, the lake never freezes. So we don't play hockey here. Hockey's an indoor sport for rich people. It's not something we do. We don't ice fish anymore. 
in Massachusetts. And I'm, I'm, I'm not that old, right? That's, that's 30 years ago. And that they've completely lost ice fishing. They've completely lost outdoor hockey um, in the state of Massachusetts. So um, Wisconsin's a bit colder, but it's possible that that's what's going to come. So the, you know, the thing about ice is it's right on that edge. You're either going to make it or you're not going to make it. Um, and, and so that's probably the biggest cultural change we'll see. The last bit, there's another box on there about other things that will happen. Because it's not just about getting warmer. The, most, the, bit, the system that gets changed the most, other than ice, is uh, water evaporating, falling down. That whole water cycle ends up changing. And this part is still a very active area of research of what happens to water systems. Um, for years, they were saying the Midwest would get drier. And that was based on just sort of a crude rule that the middle of continents tend to dry out when you get warmer. But now they're saying basically that, um, that the main thing that they're seeing happening is the intensity of when the water comes is, is getting stronger and stronger. And we have two, two sort of weak points that are relevant to the lake and, and to the people who live near the lake. The first one is if you get more intense storms, um, and depending on what time of year they come, if they come when the farmers have, have, have bare ground out there, we could see a lot more erosion. So that question of whether how long it's going to take the lake to fill in, I don't think it's 100 million years. But even if it was 100,000 years, it might, that might change fairly quickly. And if you're on a shallow bay, you don't care if the 26-foot or 21-foot part of Winnebago still isn't filled in. I mean, once your bay gets to, to be only two feet deep, that's going to sh shut off a lot of things for you. The second one is stormwater management. And there's already a recognition at the state level because all the, the size of pipes and everything that's used to construct, the engineers used to construct stormwater is based on weather data from the 1940s. Somebody sat down, wrote all these tables out about how big the pipes had to be. And, and if you use weather data from now, you basically have pipes that aren't big enough, and you have systems that can't handle it. And so, at least in, in Oshkosh, we're seeing the flooding. We're seeing a lot of things. I wouldn't be surprised if you weren't seeing it here in Fond du Lac as well. So the stormwater management systems probably aren't going to be adequate. That's going to cost us billions of dollars to, to swap them over and to, and to fix them up. With that, um, I talked to uh, Chad a week or two ago. And this is my favorite slide that Chad made for us all. And so I use it a lot. But it's a good place to end. Um, the thing that we have going forward or looking at any of these issues, the, the one that's the toughest, I, you know, I really do think as, as a scientist, we can handle a lot, a lot of these issues. I mean, people will come up with some technologies um, we'll find ways to reach people and to educate them. We'll find a lot of things. But the most challenging thing is this, uh, the fact that we have, even though it's a big lake, we have a lot of users and a lot of competing uh, ideas about what the lake is for. And, and some of those really can't go away. Um, drinking water, for example, a quarter of a million people that get their drinking water from it. And there's no substitute here. So, so some of these have to remain primary, but but I think you know we don't want to lose aesthetics or tourism or recreation. I mean that that would be a shame if we had to sort of just run the lake for the thing that you know kind of like the food and water kind of aspects of life. Um, and so finding solutions that actually work for for all of these things is going to be the you know the thing that's going to challenge us the most. Um, and and so if I can leave this on, on a note, the, uh, the reason this whole uh, series got started was because there was a sense that down here in Fond du Lac, part of the system, that people were getting interested in organizing a little bit more. And as a president of an organization that you know, tried to start something, uh, I guess about seven years ago, um, to see what kind of organization was needed on the whole system, um, I guess I'd, I'd just like to leave you with that. The, the biggest issue we have is how to get people organized, talking, 
uh, and working out how we can do all of these great things on this uh, superlative lake system that, that we happen to settle on. Thank you. Yes. When was the first dam built at the outset of Lake Winnebago? 1889 or, or 70? Yeah. I thought it was 1859. Okay. It, it, uh, one of the things, uh, if you get into the history, it's, really, it's kind of interesting. Is they, the reason they built it was for transportation, was to try to improve the, raise it a little bit so you could move through more of the system year-round. Um, and the railroad came like a decade later and completely wiped out all the entire economic reason to do that. Um, so, uh, so if you ever wonder about government building white elephants or whatever, the, the dam at Nina Menasha was one. It was built because, you know, without a lot of thought about, oh, what's going to happen when this railroad comes through and basically takes away the whole economic reason we were doing this. Now, why they raised it another two feet after that and some other things is because the dam suddenly took on, uh, probably the most important thing is it took on a lot of value just for flood control. So you had big cities forming downstream in Appleton and Green Bay and places like that. And so putting a bigger dam at, at, at Winnebago was, was basically the way to sort of protect those cities downstream. And also, uh, a lot of people may may not know this, Appleton was really the first place in, in North America that developed hydropower in a big, big way, and a whole giant industry for paper built up around it because of that cheap power. And so putting a dam in Nina Menasha lets you tap that cheap power source um, and spread it out over the years so that you could run factories with it. So. Um, but it's it's interesting, you know. In some ways, looking back, you know, like what if history had taken just a little slightly different route, <laughs> you know, in terms of settlement and all these other things. If the railroad had come in before they had thought about damming it, and and a and a tourist mecca had sprung up here in, instead of a paper industry, I mean, it could be a completely different looking system than than what we've got today. But. A lot of things happened so quickly in those early decades, big decisions that, that we live with today. Last question. So, uh, so dairy industry is going through some really big changes, moving basically to a, a big farm type of operation away from smaller farms, um, kind of like crop farming did in previous decades. And, uh, and so the question, right, was, you know, is that an improvement? Have, have those farmers, are they doing a better job or, and so on? I think there's two things to, to say. Uh, one is we, I don't think we have good enough data sets to really tell whether erosion is getting better or, or things like that. The monitoring system just isn't there to sort of say, oh, Rosendale put a farm there, they're spreading over 13,000 acres, um, you know, what's going on in the, river, in the Fox River and, uh, you know, or, or the Fond du Lac River or wherever those watersheds are. Um, so we just don't have data, we don't have the monitoring systems in place to do that. Um, the other the other reason I'd say it's hard to tell right now is there's still not very many of those big farms. They they're you know they're they're obvious they're big but scientists tend to like I mean when you compare it to working with several thousand small farms and then suddenly you've got it all concentrated in one place it, it's it's hard to say. So one one of these farms might be very well run. In fact, one company runs like you know 
something like 25% of the of the big farms. So even if that company was doing things right, that, you know. So to defend, sort of take the DNR side a little bit, I think it, it might be a little early for them to, to give a good report card on that industry. Personally, as a scientist uh, and as a president of a nonprofit that's trying to look out for the lakes, um, I, I'm hoping that the other transition, that there'll be a transition that goes along with that change where we stop pretending those are farms and start treating them like factories. Um, it's kind of like there probably was, I'm sure there was a time when industry was a small thing that everybody did in their own home and, and, and there weren't big factories. But over time we built bigger and bigger factories and we needed basically government to, to start looking at them and regulating them in a different way once they got big. Um, big entities can create big messes. So that's, that's sort of like, you know, you know, that would be my wish list, would be that at some point, you know, I just think it's sort of, it's sort of dangerous because we tend to promote agriculture and we tend to have very strong feelings about the history of agriculture, that you know, there's a way of life there and there's a lot of protection in being in agriculture and society in general doesn't feel warm and fuzzy about factories. All right? So I think I'm hoping that transition happens as well where where those and, and I think at that point then then you will say it. Because because today the the paper mills don't cause the kinds of pollution problems that they used to. They can't. They can't get away with it. Um, and, and they've kind of got crossed over to the point where they don't want to get away with it. It's not part of their business plan anymore. Um, so I will say, I mean, I, I talked to some of the folks who run the big farms and they at least say that they don't want to operate that way anymore. So they, but I don't know that we have any data. 